Hi, and welcome to the Insider and Omni Active Technologies webinar, How Science and Technology Can Reinforce Curcumin's Efficacy in Dietary Supplements. I'm Sandy Almandares, Editor-in-Chief of Natural Products Insider, and I have a few housekeeping announcements to go over before I introduce our speakers. If you'd like to revisit this webinar, you can see it on Insider's site at naturalproductsinsider.com slash webinars in five business days. We will be fielding audience questions for our speakers, so please submit your questions using the function on your screen, and I will pose those to our speakers after the presentation. If your question was not addressed, you can email them to webinars.phoenix at informa.com, and we'll be sending those to the speakers who can connect with you directly. And now I get to introduce our speakers. Uh, today they are Dr. Melinda Culver, Director of Scientific Affairs at OmniActive Health Technologies. She'll be giving an overview of curcumin research. Next, we have Dr. Jonathan Oliver, Assistant Professor at Texas Christian University. He will take a deeper dive into heart health research. And Christopher Shanahan, Global Program Manager at Frost & Sullivan, who will be cover covering the market data. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Culver. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Culver from OmniActive, and I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. This afternoon, I'll be discussing how the dietary supplement industry can approach and design research that translates into focused results targeted for consumer needs and claim substantiation, much how OmniActive has provided claim substantiation in healthy populations for curcumin. My goal is to help you develop a frame of reference around the key issues that you must address when you work with curcumin. I hope to provide you with a foundation with which you can use to evaluate a source of curcumin or design your own research. So there's a lot of interest and activity in turmeric and curcumin, and you can see this if you just look at the numbers. In the first 10 years after Deshaies, there were only 1,000 publications, but in the 10 years after that, 2006 to 2016, the number has skyrocketed. This just underscores the amount of research that is occurring in this area. Even at the consumer level, the excitement is there. Tumeric is ranked number one across all searches for dietary nutrients or ingredients, and the industry is responding. The number of new product launches for turmeric and curcumin in the marketplace has been increasing every year, from 86 in 2014 to 96 in 2015 to 120 in 2016. For our purpose, however, we'll focus on the dietary supplement category because although a lot of research is being conducted, much of the innovation and research is geared toward these types of commercial applications. It's also in this space that criticism has been leveled, most recently the article in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, that can directly impact consumer perception about curcumin despite the large amount of published research showing the contrary. With the right technologies and science, we can address these concerns and come up with solutions that support curcumin's efficacy. Natural curcumin contains three curcuminoids, curcumin, demethoxymicure curcumin, and bisdemethoxycurcumin. As a note, turmeric and curcumin and curcuminoids have all been used interchangeably in the literature. If you are looking for either a natural curcumin delivery form or a purified curcumin product, you must look for these three compounds in their natural profile, about 70 to 80% curcumin, 18 to 25% demethoxycurcumin, and 2 to 5% bisdemethoxycurcumin. Natural turmeric should contain all three of these compounds, and this is easily verifiable by standard analytical methods like HPLC. Adulterated or synthetic formulas would show up as a single peak on your analysis. A lot of science and debate has centered around these three compounds, but it's worth noting that ensuring the presence of these three curcuminoids in their natural profile is perhaps the first step in ensuring efficacy. Curcumin science casts a wide net of promise, but within this promise is the question, can it be good for everything? There's a recent paper in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry that says that curcumin gives too many false positives that are not borne out in human studies. The limitation of such critiques is that they do not have an applied, they have not applied a full understanding of all the issues that must be addressed for curcumin formulation. They did not discuss solubilization or dissolution, 
or uptake, or the correct populations for testing, or even the full body of literature. They say, if it can't be good for everything, then it can't be good for anything. And that's not really the case. There are still many things curcumin can be good for, but you do need to be clear on how it is used to demonstrate the benefit. So focusing curcumin scope begins with looking at what applications are best suited for formulation as a dietary supplement. Because curcumin can modulate so many biochemical and cell signaling pathways, we see a lot of potential benefits. But curcumin's benefits are more suitable for dietary supplements when focused on general health conditions, such as antioxidant protection, brain health, healthy inflammation and joint health, cardiovascular function, and even metabolic health that might include liver function and healthy blood sugar metabolism. These larger categories can function as a foundation for more nuanced benefits. Although consumers are looking at many areas for supplementation, including diseases, in the dietary supplement space, you will not be formulating for major disease conditions. So in this industry, these are the types of health benefits that we believe would warrant additional focus. And these categories are relevant for supplement formulations for several reasons. One, there's a large consumer interest in these areas, so it makes financial sense. Two. These are within regulatory limits of research, so it makes regulatory sense. And three, the industry and companies like OmniActive within the industry are actively engaged in researching in these areas for benefits and claims, so it's logical that this would continue. In light of the activity in the dietary supplement space, how do we ensure our formulations are effective and our science is relevant? Compounds can be poorly soluble, poorly absorbed, or both. In formulations, these conditions often lead to large dose requirements, which not only limits the clinical impact of the compound, but can also reduce consumer compliance. And this may lead to variable results and mistrust. You cannot formulate with an inherently insoluble molecule like curcumin and not have problems when you have doses that are ineffective or that cannot reach their target tissues or that are not absorbed. Developing effective products with curcumin requires addressing two categories. Formulation, developing strategies to address solubility, bioavailability, absorption, and metabolism. And research, establishing strong clinical outcomes based on well-designed studies to explore the mechanisms of action, identify dose and efficacy, as well as delivery forms. Perhaps the biggest challenge for any formulator or ingredient supplier is solubility and bioavailability, as this will directly impact efficacy. It is estimated that only about 1% of curcumin is absorbed from standard powdered extracts. And this is not only an issue of dose, requiring large amounts to show some level in the blood, but also of efficacy. No matter what dose is used, it may not translate into a benefit because it is not absorbed. That's why enhanced forms of curcumin have been replacing standard forms. And with the rapid increase in enhanced formulas, it's important that proper analytical methods be followed and the results assessed accordingly. Some who are looking at curcumin are looking at it for a limited spectrum of applications, and then they try to apply those conclusions across the entire gamut of curcumin's benefits, which does not really translate. When you systematically deal with issues on formulation, delivery, uptake, absorption, and study design, you do get results. And this means that establishing some guidelines by which bioavailability is measured is vital. Establishing baseline blood levels of curcuminoids absorbed from a standard is very important. If the dose of standard or control does not show in serum samples, you need to ask yourself, is the dose of standard powder or control too low? If you're comparing the rise in curcuminoids from your product to essentially zero levels from a standard powder, how relevant or accurate are your findings? Controlling for factors that can affect the outcomes is also important. Were the subjects fasted or given a meal that can affect absorption? Are they an appropriate population? 
Are you using proper validated analytical methods like AUC and standard PK measures that are commonly found in pharmaceutical models? All these factors are critical because they form the basis as to how bioavailability translates into efficacious dosages that consumers find acceptable. Even after concumin is absorbed, the challenge of rapid metabolism needs to be addressed. There are various schools of thought on how and what to measure. Is it free curcumin, curcuminoids, its conjugates? The reality is that the science around the metabolism of curcuminoids and their activity in the body once absorbed is still unclear. But what we do know is that despite its rapid metabolism, curcumins in some form are reaching the target tissues and they are having some kind of functional benefit as seen in many of the studies. And in the case of enhanced curcumin, those effects are greater than an equivalent dose of standard powder. Additional work needs to be done to arrive at the consensus, but clearly what needs to happen is to establish the fact that there is either a physiological effect and or a functional benefit occurring. In the interim, while the science is trying to catch up, we recommend to look at the total relative bioavailability of curcumin in, and all its forms in the serum. To look at the dose of curcumin, if you have an artificially low dose of curcumin, you won't get very convincing results in the terms of bioavailability. And also look for the physiological action and functional benefits. After addressing the challenges around solubility, absorption, and metabolism, a well-designed research program helps ensure focused outcomes. This is becoming progressively more important as curcumin becomes more popular and researchers begin to scrutinize studies, as we've seen with the JMC article. We need to be clear that unlike drugs that target specific pathways, curcuminoids are a complex group of molecules that target multiple pathways. Because curcumin shows such a broad assay reactivity, it could be assumed that it would not qualify for ongoing research until more refined methods of extraction, purification, and characterization of its individual components are completed, but understanding curcumin's cellular activity is only a starting point. Curcumin research needs to follow a stepwise process that starts with nutrigenomics and in vitro work to understand its mechanisms of action, progress to in vivo research to correlate and confirm cellular activity, and finally to well-designed human clinical trials. All of this will build a solid foundation for a strong portfolio for supporting efficacy and claims in your products. Creating a foundation for human studies starts at the cellular level, nutrigenomics. That provides insight into mechanisms of actions and targets that will be further evaluated. Nutrigenomics and in vitro data will provide the direction for future studies and, as we've seen with our own nutrigenomics work at, on the active with curcumin, curcumin, has indicated some primary categories in which curcuminoids would be the most beneficial. There's a lot of critique that there are so many hits on the benefits of curcumin at the cellular level but we see the same thing uh, when we're working with these cell lines at our innovation center in Canada. Um, but having looked into the results, we go further then and we determine what these hits mean and how they translate into the next stage of research design. In vivo research is the next step for establishing efficacious outcomes. Whereas nutrigenomics can provide the direction of future research, in vivo research will validate those effects seen at the cellular level that warrant further investigation. In vivo research also helps establish a link between the targets highlighted in nutrigenomics work and indications for proper delivery, dosage, and timing, tolerability and safety, and potential efficacy for the conditions for which it's been used. For example, and I'll use one from today's presentation, our preclinical work in in vitro nutrigenomics demonstrated the activity in key markers of vascular function, which led to an assessment of curcumin bioavailability in vivo to carry all the way forward to a human clinical trial on curcumin, which is what Dr. Oliver will be speaking about a little later. At this point, based on all of the completed nutrigenomic and in vivo research, a clear direction on what to study and how in, clin 
in human clinical trials can be established. Each study needs to be designed to meet its intended objective. For example, conducting studies in healthy populations will translate benefits to general audience and allow for health claims. If your outcome is intended to be more universally accepted or you are looking for more specific lifestyle issues within a population, geography may need to be defined. Aside from bioavailability studies, the majority of curcumin's benefits may be um, not as acute, and therefore the duration of the study must be considered. Dosage may also vary on the specific condition, and the more science you complete prior to your study with nutrigenomic and in vitro work, the better your estimation of your required dosage will be. Validated measures, including methods of analysis, to technologies used to measure effects, to what you're measuring should be clear and accepted by the broader scientific community. Finally, measure specific biomarkers and the impact of curcumin on those biomarkers. For example, inflammatory biomarkers may be different in the disease population compared to the healthy population, and curcumin may affect each population differently. Curcumin's benefits are numerous due to its ability to target multiple cellular pathways. However, not all of its actions are relevant. Maintaining curcumin's place in the market as an effective nutraceutical requires focusing on its most promising potential. Challenges around formulation are being addressed by the industry and establishing guidelines to assess bioavailability will provide meaningful results across the different platforms. Despite its high metabolic conversion, we know that curcumin and potentially its metabolites work. Studies evaluating total curcuminoids and formulas preserving curcuminoid activity can help support their role as efficacious agents in the dietary supplement industry. To ensure healthy outcomes and build strong claims, research on curcumin should follow a stepwise process that begins with preclinical work and provides the launch port for appropriate, well-designed human studies that are so important to claim substantiation in the dietary industry. To describe in detail how we at OmniActive took the results seen in our nutrigenomic studies with curcumin through to the in vivo testing and then on to our FlowMed study is Dr. Oliver. Thank you so much, Dr. Culver. And now I am happy to turn it over to Dr. Jonathan Oliver, who will dive into OmniActive's FlowMed study. Good afternoon. To follow up on what Dr. Culver said, this represents the culmination of research from the in vitro level to the bioavailability level and now to a human clinical trial. So over the last, I guess this was a year and a half ago, we conducted what's known as the FlowMed study. And here you can see the name. It's just we were examining the effect of a novel formulation of curcumin on um, flow-mediated dilation, which I'll explain here in a little bit. So why did we choose cardiovascular disease? As Dr. Culver highlighted is there are numerous um, potential mechanisms in which curcumin may influence um, various diseases. Of those, cardiovascular disease is possibly um, the most important because it's not only the leading cause of death um, in the United States. What we often see is cardiovascular diseases are often asymptomatic and can begin as early as childhood. One of those things that can lead to cardiovascular disease is damage to the vascular endothelium. Now, the vascular endothelium um, is a small uh, monolayer of cells which releases um, different molecules, most notably nitric oxide. So these endothelial cells, which um, encompass the entire vascular wall um, throughout our cardiovascular system, are very important. And so optimizing the function of those cells um, through endothelial function can improve health um, and different lifestyle categories such as sports and exercise and even sports nutrition. So again, going back to what doc, Dr. Culver had highlighted is they started out with in vitro studies which showed um, an improvement in ENOS, um, which is nitric oxide, which I just highlighted, is one of the substances released from um, the endothelial molecule, endothelium. Following up to that, there was a study conducted on curcumin, which showed that the plasma concentrations over a 12-hour period were elevated compared to a standard curcumin mixture, showing that there was improved bioavailability. This is very important considering what Dr. Culver had highlighted in that curcumin is rapidly um, metabolized and is excreted through the system. 
though finally following up with this FlowMed study based on these preclinical studies to really show the efficacy in a population. And what's important is that this was a healthy population. So how do you do this? Well, endothelial dysfunction, as I said, was, is an early um, mechanism that can lead to cardiovascular damage. We can measure um, endothelial function by a process called flow-mediated dilation. What this means is we basically take a blood pressure cuff and we apply it to the upper arm and we inflate it until it's above blood pressure to stop all blood flow. We hold that on for several minutes and then we rapidly um, release the pressure. And as we rapidly release the pressure, we see how the blood vessels, the endothelial, respond. That response can tell us how healthy the blood vessels are. And what we know is that for every 1% increase in flow media dilation over a period of time, we can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by 9 to 17%. So in order to test the effects of the novel formulation of curcumin, curcumin in this study, we did three different groups. One was a placebo group. The other was 250 milligrams curcumin, which provided 50 milligrams of the curcuminoids previously discussed or 1,000 milligrams of curcumin, which contained 200 milligrams of curcuminoids. All of the subjects were healthy, and you can see here in the table below the health of the subjects. Uh, we chose fairly young subjects, average age of around 21 to 22, and they all had normal body mass index, which is in relation to their obesity. But what's more important is their VO2 max, and a VO2 max is a measure of cardiovascular function. Um, and they had fairly high cardiorespiratory functioning. Now, while this is not a direct measure of endothelial function, VO2 max is directly linked to cardiovascular health and cardiovascular fitness. And another important note is to know that we were evenly distributed between men and women. So after an eight-week period, we again measured flow media dilation. So what we found after the eight-week period is that the 200 milligram curcuminoids provided by the 1,000 milligrams of curcumin resulted in a clinically significant improvement of 3% in flow media dilation versus placebo. Further, the low dose, which only provided 50 milligrams of curcuminoids, increased flow media dilation by 1.7%. While it was not statistically significant, as we've already highlighted, a 1% increase in flow media dilation can it decrease cardiovascular risk by 9 to 17%. So we saw a decrease in cardiovascular risk even in those with the low dose. So this led to the conclusion that eight weeks of the 200 milligrams of curcuminoids provided by the 1,000 milligrams of curcumin resulted in a clinically meaningful improvement in endothelial function. Now if we look here on the next page, what we can see is that the changes over time in the placebo, the 50 milligrams, and the 200 milligrams. As you can see, the placebo actually went down, though not significant. The 50 milligrams went up, and the 200 milligrams went up significantly, as highlighted by the p-value of 0 0.007. Further, compared to the placebo, both groups increased substantially. You have a 1.7 improvement over the placebo with the low dose, and a 3 point um, improvement over the placebo in the high dose. So compared to what we had talked about earlier when you're saying that a 1% improvement leads to a 9 to 17% reduction, at 200 milligrams you're seeing a reduction of 27 to 51% in cardiovascular risk, while even if the low dose you're seeing a reduction in 15 to 29% in cardiovascular risk. That is very clinically significant. So what is this study really telling us? Well, going back to what I had talked about, flow media dilation is a predictor of cardiovascular health. Unfortunately, this is not something that's regularly tested in the doctor's office. Oftentimes, it's overlooked. And as I said at the beginning, it's an early event in the cardiovascular disease pathway, and it can happen as early as childhood. The significant results related to our study, specifically at the high dose, represents a culmination of a long-term focus on research from in vitro to a bioavailability to a clinical research study in humans. And finally, the fact that 200 milligrams enhances FMD in apparently healthy subjects and that even low dose enhances to some degree, representing a reduction in cardiovascular risk factors. 
Therefore, we can solidly say that the curcumin supplementation may present a simple lifestyle strategy for decreasing the risk of cardiovascular diseases in people who are apparently healthy. And it's important to highlight apparently healthy because as we saw in the previous diagram, the change in flaminated dilation suggests that even healthy subjects with apparent may see improvement. And now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Christopher Shanahan. So thank you, Dr. Oliver. Um, we all know that having great scientific backing helps consumers' interest in ingredients. Um, and Christopher Shanahan, the Global Program Manager at Frost & Sullivan, will give uh, more information on the opportunities in the curcumin market. Great. Thank you, Sandy. My name is Chris Shanahan. I'm the Global Director of our Agriculture and Nutrition Research at Frost & Sullivan. And uh, we've recently done a lot of research in the global curcumin market um, and also specifically in the United States. Um, and um, just looking at the United States by itself, we see that there's been significant um, growth in this segment of the marketplace. Out of a $30.2 billion U.S. dietary supplement market in 2015, uh, the curcumin dietary supplements market uh, makes up a small but significantly growing $200 million market in 2015. In fact, uh, we are expecting 16.3 to 17.6 percent compound annual growth rate over the next five years, meaning that it will be approaching $500 million by 2020. Um, this demand is um, strongly correlated with um, the growing awareness among the consumer base of the um, actual specific benefits of using curcumin-based dietary supplements and a wide a variety of therapeutic benefit areas, um, as Dr. Uh, Oliver um, has noted as well, Dr. Culver has noted, um, there's been a significant amount of scientific research and substantiation of the efficacy of curcumin-based products for a wide variety of ther therapeutic areas. Um, this typically translates into growth and awareness among the consumer base, and this cascades back up to the demand for finished branded products and also ingredients as well through the value chain. Looking at the specific areas where uh, curcumin likely has a strong uh, potential play um, in the dietary supplements market, just in the United States, um, you see that you know we're looking at really big numbers here of um, expected growth, uh, such as uh, antioxidants, cardiovascular health, um, of which uh, Dr. Oliver just uh, noted, which is a 3.27. Uh, billion dollar dietary supplement um, area, therapeutic area within the United States. And not only is it a gr growth market of plus um, 6 percent um, compound annual growth rate expected through over the next five years, uh, but it's also a lot of products in that space can um, achieve a, a strong uh, premiumization or premium on those products. Uh, we've seen it in similar products. Um, such as omega-3s or um, fiber products. And we're seeing it also in the curcumin market as well, where there is there is an ability to get premiums um, from selling, you know, uh, targeted cardiovascular health dietary supplements in this market. And also a big segment of the market, uh, which includes inflammation and pain relief products, is just general health and wellness as well. As the science grows um, and consumers and formulators build awareness, um, you know, those um, we would expect curcumin to take a much bigger slice of this segment. And other areas as well, um, you know, related to these um, the benefits of using uh, curcumin, such as in diabetic health or joint health related to inflammation, will also probably see a significant boost as well in growth. Now, now while um, the turmeric or the curcumin um, ingredients market is, or in general, the market in general is large, uh, our study uh, that we have forthcoming um, is, and specifically the presentation I'm about to note today is only focused on the dietary supplement category. Those numbers I just reported only includes uh, herbal and nutraceutical and dietary supplements, but there's also many other adjacencies, uh, such as cosmetic products uh, for anti-aging or antioxidants uh, and protective benefits um, through topical means, um, of course, functional foods, and not just 
functional foods where you consume turmeric or curcumin for its benefits, assuming that it's uh, um, you know soluble and bioavailable, but also has other secondary benefits or traditional benefits, in fact, such as coloring and spice additives. Uh, and then, of course, there you know well beyond the scope of this presentation, there's many other different application areas where curcumin has a has a potential play in, such as uh, uh, photovoltaic applications, dyes um, in non-food applications, and um, and other industrial applications. Now, um, now clearly, you know, when we look at the market for dietary supplements in general and curcumin specifically. Um, you know, we we want to focus on the specific growth factors that are going to drive the marketplace. Um, and you know, when we look at market growth, and we'll talk more about this as well throughout this conversation. You know, we're looking at you know what's going to drive the target market, the size of the target market. What's going to increase market penetration versus other products that deliver similar therapeutic benefits, uh, and also. How do we um, understand how consumers are utilizing this and expand beyond more than one therapeutic area, all of which contributes to the market's growth, and all of which is going to be heavily dependent on the science uh, being able to help substantiate the efficacy of um, you know, its multiple, you know, multiple benefits across a wide set of therapeutic areas, uh, which is why you see um, many companies investing time, effort, and science in um, areas such as inflammation, joint health, sports nutrition um, areas um, as well. Um, so, and also not only just focusing on and testing its efficacy, but also trying to um, focus R&D time and effort in terms of uh, developing the technologies in, term, in, in order to increase the bioavailability, increase solubility, which in turn will likely, as we learned earlier, increase uh, efficacy, and that will create a feedback loop to consumers that will build awareness for these products uh, and its benefits and um, impact the number of potential buyers in the market, increase market penetration versus incumbent products that serve other therapeutic areas, and of course, um, increase utilization per user as well as they uh, look to curcumin products as a means to help them uh, address certain uh, therapeutic needs. You know, uh, turmeric has been around, as uh, everyone, most of you know, for a long time. It's uh, traditionally an herb, a botanical, a colorant, a dye, a flavor, a fragrant. Um, and, and much of the processing traditionally, especially natural turmeric, um, you know, upstream is very traditional. You, just, you know, you create the powders and then you create the paste, an oleoresin-based paste. And then you go through a, um, a natural uh, ex um, curcumin extraction to get to the 95%. Um, and that's really where, um, you know, that's, that's the primary ingredient that you see in the market today, utilized by product formulators and what consumers are looking for, curcumin-based products at 95% uh, um, concentration levels. And, and as we learned as well, that's where a lot of the science has been focusing in on However, um, what we're finding is that we're, you know, of, of the 95% extracts, you know, the enhanced curcumin extracts that are um, specially formulated, altered in order to increase uh, solubility and also bioavailability in order to in turn enhance its efficacy as reported by, um, you, know, you know, from the um, literature, scientific literature. This will only see uptick growth, and we're already seeing this uh, uh, divergence in the marketplace where enhanced curcumin extract products, consumers are looking for this and adopting this at higher rates versus uh, standard curcumin products. Uh, what we also see in the marketplace, however, is um, sy synthetic curcumin, which is, um, you know, clearly from a, you know, that's from a much different processing chain from the petrochemical uh, pro, uh, value chain, uh, and it's achieving very high levels of concentration, 99.9%, .9%, but the synthetic-based curcumin products haven't gone through the same rigor of uh, demonstrating efficacy for addressing these, demonstrating whether it's bioavailable and soluble, um, and, um, and whether it's even safe as well versus natural, uh, naturally derived curcumin products.
you know, coming back to the market drivers and or continuing on rather, um, you know, there's a lot of external factors that's going to grow the demand for curcumin based nutraceutical products in the long run. You know, clearly, um, as uh, the baby boomers and the Generation X uh, generations, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, um, you know, grow in importance and they are looking for means to address their health and wellness needs um, related to um, inflammatory issues, which in turn impacts multiple uh, potential dis other diseases um, or anti-cancer properties or diabe diabetes, et cetera. You know, this cohort, this age co those cohorts, Generation X and Baby Boomers, are going to be looking for preventive means to help midi you know, um, mediate uh, risk. Um, so dietary supplements have a unique place to, through nutrition, um, you know, is able to deliver on helping uh, end users and consumers help manage their uh, total health and wellness um, lifestyle. Uh, et cetera. So we do expect this to be a significant driver in the growth of the marketplace and a major contributing factor to that plus 15% growth rate we're expecting over the next five and likely 10 years. Uh, and then of course, um, you know, um, you know, th these consumers are increasingly savvy. They're using, um, you know, alternative means to learn about new products. And curcumin is very popular as uh, Dr. Colred noted earlier. It's Curcumin is tracking high on Google Trends, where we've seen it, you know, uh, as of last year, it's one of the top food trends and top nutrition trends as well. Consumers are aware of curcumin, um, you know, historically as well because of its traditional uses. So that helps substantiate um, the growth in the marketplace, and we expect that to continue on into the future. And of course, the science, you know, as consumers read more and more about these products, they're going to be looking for the science, and they're going to be looking for uh, good companies that are, you know, making, you know, substantiated claims, referring to the science, investing in the science to not, in not just to demonstrate efficacy, but also in technological advances in curcumin extracts in order to increase bioavailability and solubility. And in turn, um, hopefully that will result in higher efficacy in a wide plateau of therapeutic areas. So, you know, in this study that we're conducting, we're doing a lot of research in how decision makers in the value chain um, select specific ingredients and, and understanding what they're looking for in the marketplace. You know, in looking at curcumin as a case study, clearly we're finding that concentration of uh, the curcuminoids, um, standard, standardized to 95% or higher, is a critical decision um, criteria um, or ingredient selection criteria among um, formulators um, because it's derived from what consumers are looking for. And what consumers are also looking for is, def you know, your standard um, uh, natural um, or I wouldn't say organic, but, you know, non-GMO, chemical free, what I would call the, you know, freedom or free of, you know, benefits of using natural based ingredients, uh, you know, free of toxins, free of pesticides, free of GMO. Uh, free of um, solvent-based production processes, um, maybe even um, gross. And then most importantly, these products, clearly what's important to formulators is that this is uh, patented, branded, um, and, um, you know, and not intellectual property is protected um, in order to carry on that competitive, you know, that, that competitive advantage onto the, you know, onto the consumer and, so, you know, and keep that product safe. And of course, overall, both consumers and formulators and the ingredient suppliers alike wants to make sure that this product is safe, which um, most, you know, is since it is a food, essentially derived from food and natural, uh, you know, product, curcumin has been given grass status as well. There's other uh, criteria selection as well uh, that we've noted here, but definitely the ones that I've noted are the leading drivers of selection for curcumin uh, options, um, you know, available to formulators in this marketplace. You know, um, you know, just taking a quick look at the, um, the the competitive structure, the marketplace. You know, from the per point of view, not not just of the uh, formulators, but also the ingredient suppliers. I think what's most important here is, you know, there are a number of suppliers in the marketplace looking to uh, provide natural, safe, 
substantiated uh, ingredients. Um, and what we're finding that a lot of, um, you know, these high quality turmeric varieties are coming from India um, as well, you know, uh, with natural curcumin content in turmeric varieties ranging as high as 9% versus other areas of the world where, where curcumin concentrations are um, up to 6%. And, and and that's really important because you know that tip, you know when you already have naturally high curcumin concentration levels in turmeric that that lowers the cost of concentration achieving natural um, levels of 95 percent plus concentrations and those you know and you know whether it's cost effectiveness and benefit that you know it preserves the you know the identity the natural identity of the product so it's definitely a, a competitive advantage um, to take into consideration. So I, I talked a lot today about, you know, clearly making that connection from, from science to the market. Um, and clearly the market is looking for, and they always look for the market, you know, especially in the herbals, nutraceuticals, and dietary, dietary supplement market. Consumers are looking for products with substantiated um, claims. They're looking for products that helps provide um, demonstrated benefits. Um, and clearly, you know, the target base that's most important here, um, especially with respect to curcumin, is um, you know clearly antioxidants. Um, uh, you know, and that could be, you know, have multiple secondary therapeutic uh, benefits. Any um, you know demonstrating any type of support for um, cardiovascular-related um, conditions uh, or biomarkers such as cholesterol or healthy blood levels of cholesterol, um, joint health inflammation in general, weight management, and di diabetes-related benefits. You know, that's kind of the low-hanging fruit in this marketplace. I mean, as we've demonstrated today, the science is already pointing to significant um, and, and clinically significant results of using curcumin in these areas. Uh, and consumers are going to recognize that and respond through uh, increased purchases. And of course, um, you know, as the market grows, the industry grows as well. And in Additional research and benefits will cascade to other areas in the dietary supplement market, such as an anti-cancer, anti-fungal, anti-diabetic, as I noted. You know, these are kind of like, you know, in the mid to long run, uh, but will, you know, definitely on the top of mind among um, ingredient suppliers and formulators. And consumers are interested in these therapeutic areas as, way, as well and looking for um, many nutraceutical products that could help support address some of these needs. And of course, you know, we don't stop at dietary supplements. I mean, once the science and the market grows, adjacencies that we already talked about, um, very, very top level, such as cosmetics and personal care, functional foods, and even animal nutrition, you know, there are secondary and tertiary benefits that derive from, you know, um, you know, human-based clinical research substantiating these claims. These other industry sectors will recognize that and really start to, um, expand that addressable market that's available to formulators today, ingredient suppliers um, as well. And, and most importantly, you know, those who need it most will get these products. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Sandy. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for that presentation. And thanks to all of our speakers. We will now be turning to our Q&A section of the webinar. Uh, you can see that there's the contact information for each of the speakers on the screen if you'd like to reach out to them directly, but you can also submit your questions to webinars.phoenix at informa.com if, if they're not asked on today's webinar. Uh, if you still have questions and you haven't submit, submitted that, you can use the function on your screen. Um, my first question is for Dr. Culver. Uh, how did you establish your dose for standard curcumin in your bioavailability study? That, that's a great question. Um, First, uh, you have to establish a baseline that allows for some appreciable level of curcuminoids in the blood. So that's, that's your main target, right? What we've done at OmniActive through our research at PEI and through researching all of the literature out there on curcumin and curcuminoids, we've established that approximately 1,800 milligrams is about the dose of standard curcumin powder that you would need. This is important because if you do not have any appreciable curcuminoids 
assayable in the blood, you won't have anything with which to uh, measure your product against. Um, and this could actually skew your results. So one way is to, is to just really research uh, and look at what's out there and what your standard is going to give you in your research studies. But it should be noted that because the absorption of curcumin in its standard form is very low, uh, usually these doses are very high. As I stated before, we had to use about 1,880 milligrams before we saw an effect in the blood. Interesting. Um, also, for Dr. Culver, so did you suggest that whole curcumin and its metabolites are more effective than either one alone? Well, I do want to note that the, the science is still out on this. So nobody really knows if it's curcumin or curcuminoids or some sort of conjugate that, that's doing the effect. But what we know is that when you give curcumin, you do get an effect. And so while we're still waiting for the preponderance of evidence to, to show us maybe which, which um, of the curcuminoids um, does cause a more of an effect or a greater effect or maybe a specific effect that you're looking for. We do know that if you're supplying natural curcumin, uh, you'll be looking for the three curcuminoids in their natural profile. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I've got some questions real quick for Dr. Oliver. Um, can you further expand on how increasing FMD can help with sports performance? Potentially increase blood flow to the um, working muscles. Um, if we increase blood flow to the working muscles, particularly during aerobic exercise, we're going to increase the ability to transport oxygen. Okay, and the transport of oxygen, does that, that help with strength or endurance or both? Uh, with endurance. It could potentially help um, post-resistance exercise by increasing um, the availability of key nutrients to the muscle. Um, but probably most importantly is for aerobic endurance. Okay. How relevant is increasing FMD to a healthy population? Well, I think, as I said in the beginning, um, that endothelial dysfunction can occur any, even in the absence of any of the other risk factors that seem to be apparent at a doctor's visit. Um, and as we saw in some of ours, we even saw some healthy individuals who had what we considered less than optimal endothelial function. Um, and so even in a healthy population, the unknown um, is always out there. And at least from my perspective, if I can reduce my development of cardiovascular disease, even if I do not know that I have poor endothelial function, I think that's a positive. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and this question looks like it's for Chris. Um, with so many curcumin products entering the market, what can formulators do to differentiate their products? Well, um, no, that's a good question. Um, you know, um, clearly when you're looking at differentiation, um, you know, one of this, you know, Tip, you know, one way to do it is to protect the IP, as I noted earlier. Um, you know, use branded uh, ingredients um, from reputable sources um, that um, that is um, you know uses you know that consumers are aware of um, as well. That will help differentiate your product formulators. If, you know, if you use those type of ingredients, um, of course, uh, pairing it with other ingredients uh, that have. Uh, um, related product, you know, related therapeutic benefits. Now, of course, um, you know, um, that, that's easier said than done because the combination, the synergy of ingredients is important to take into consideration. And, you, you know, and one ought to look at the science to see if that's something that should be done. Um, that's probably a, a midterm to long-term differentiation strategy in terms of clubbing multiple ingredients together into a uh, multi-ingredient product. Um, but I think also, um, you know, I think in the short term, though, using, um, you know, following along those ingredient categories, you know, using that, uh, you know, grass status source, um, you know, using a free from product, um, you know, free from chemicals, free from the use of um, EEC solvent based uh, production processes um, and other um, drivers should be, a, a, you know, that will help with uh, supporting that growth and being a different, you know, being different in the marketplace.
We've got a couple of questions on delivery forms, probably for Dr. Culver, um, but anyone feel free to jump in if you have a response. Um, what is the best form of delivery for curcumin based on current research? So really, the best form of curcumin uh, really, you need to really look at what you're trying to make. What is your formula? Who is your target audience? What are you trying to accomplish with your formula? So this will alter which form you may use. So you may find that some work better um, based on your research, based on your preclinical work or your clinical work. It also depends on your drug, your delivery form, right? So something that's in a tablet uh, may not, the form that works best for a tablet may not work best for a capsule or if you're putting it in a drink shake or what have you. Uh, each form is going to have their own challenges and you may have find out that you have to switch to some other form to give you exactly what you're needing in terms of results, target audience, as well as your final delivery form. Okay, and do you think curcumin, uh, curcumin would still work uh, if it was in a food product, um, especially if that food product was rich in fat? Certainly. Um, in fact, curcumin works quite well with, uh, with a fatty meal uh, in traditional when it's used as a spice in traditional foods, it's served in, with fatty foods. So this really helps the absorption of it. So absolutely, curcumin would work great in a formula that contains some additional fats. Great. Um, and this one is perhaps for Dr. Oliver. Um, when looking at clinical studies that only use a few healthy young men in a specific age range, like how valid is that uh, population compared to a more aged general population of supplement users? I'm sorry, now what's the question as, as a narrow range compared to a broad range? Yeah, so what's, you know, what, is there like a cutoff and, you know, if you're looking at a, a, a study that only used a few healthy young men in this, you know, specific age range, you know, in their 20s or so, uh, how valid is that compared to a, a supplement user you might find uh, in the general population? Well, I think um, in terms of our study specifically, the choice of using younger population was to really show the benefits in a healthy young population as opposed to someone who is more aged. Um, endothelial dysfunction can occur as early as 40 in men and maybe a little bit later in women. Um, but if you use that, you're really um, running the risk of looking at other medications and you really can't identify um, what type of changes are actually occurring. Whereas if you're seeing the changes in young, you can obviously um, extrapolate that as to what you would find in those who are more aged with a greater degree of endothelial dysfunction. Now there is a previous study done in uh, postmenopausal women um, that had a greater degree of endothelial dysfunction, and they saw improvements as well, but not to the degree that we saw in the young, healthy population. Right. Thank you. This one I think is also for Dr. Culver. Um, any information or research available on curcumin and eye health? There's, there's not a lot of information out there. Um, we at Omniactives have done a study in an animal model, um, with rats that showed a positive effect of curcumin on uh, diabetic retinopathy. But in general, there's not a lot of information out there in the literature. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this one is also for Dr. Culver. Um, does, what's the difference between solubility and bioavailability? Are, are they the same thing? Not really. So. The equation solubility equaling bioavailability is not quite correct. So something can be soluble, but the body may not want to absorb it. So it's not necessarily bioavailable. Um, so in reality, although they do sort of go hand in hand, because if something isn't soluble, it's difficult for you to get into the body, uh, they don't necessarily equal each other. So something that is soluble may not necessarily be bioavailable. Are there any observed side effects of supplementing with curcumin, or are there any cases where one would not want to supplement with curcumin? I think, uh, Dr. Oliver, that would be a good question for you. In terms of my knowledge, there is no um, side effects associated. We saw no side effects associated with our study, um, and we were doing a high dose of 200 milligrams curcuminoids with 1,000 milligrams of curcumin. 
Um, so I am not aware of any side effects, no. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any anti-diabetic properties, or is there any uh, research being conducted on this? There's some um, evidence out there that, that demonstrates that curcumin may have an effect on decreasing glucose levels in the blood. Um, and, of course, uh, as I previously mentioned, the, um, the diabetic retinopathy animal model study. Um, but, again, um, not really sure of, of, of how many people are actually targeting diabetics uh, as, a, as a group for studying. Okay, great. Uh, and let's go back to study design. Um, perhaps this is for you, Dr. Oliver. Um, mm -hmm. If there is a, uh, like, what, what number of, of subjects would you think that you would need to be able to generate um, good scientific data? You know, what's the, the popula population and size and power that brands could use for their, to substantiate claims? Well, we really look at um, what specific claim we're trying to make. So in, in our study, we were looking for the claim of at least a 1% increase in FMD, and we knew to make that claim we needed a certain number of subjects to have that, that power. Um, so I think it really depends on what claim you're trying to make because you go and you take that claim and then you extrapolate and determine what power you need and how many subjects you need. Okay. So it can vary depending on if you have something that you expect that you really require a large increase, then you're going to need a greater number of subjects to represent that likely. Um, however, in our case, when there's a 1% increase that's showing or improvement is showing huge reductions in cardiovascular risk, you can do a little bit smaller sample size. So it really depends on what the outcome measure is. Thank you. Has there been any market reaction to their recent published FMD uh, uh, study, and what has that been? The FlowMed study, sorry. Well, it's probably a question for me. Um, the, I think it's a little too early to tell, um, you know, because it's just recently launched, but uh, definitely that's a key part of the recent uh, report that we're conducting right now on the uh, on the uh, global curcumin market um, with, a, with a focus on the U.S. Uh, you know, when we t conduct that type of research, you know, we look for market reactions to clinical research. What I can tell you, though, is when we look at um, other um, examples and case studies in other categories, um, there's, all, you know, there's always, a, you know, definitely an uptick in the demand for an ingredient if there's a report, a study, uh, clinical results that do come out um, in the marketplace, and once it's uh, digested by the market, understood by the market, you will see that translate into sales. Great. Um, and this is a question about grass, generally recognized as safe. Um, does curcumin have to be grassed when it is used in food and beverages, and what is the grass status of curcumin? So curcumin ingredients should be grassed. Uh, if you're planning on using it, um, Omniactive Curcuin is self-affirmed grass for use in food and beverage. Great, thanks. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, what is the percentage of curcumoids in Curcuin? Curcuin contains um, about 20% minimum of curcuminoids. Great. Thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, we do have a lot more questions that we could ask, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, so thank you again to the speakers. Thanks to OmniActive for sponsoring this webinar, and of course thanks to the audience for attending.